she went missing in 1978. She was just 12, about to turn 13. And it's devastating because this was the very first day that she was going to walk to the school bus on her own. Like, she was about to turn 13. She told her mom, like, I'm old enough. Oh, my God. She went missing, and later her skull would be found in a paint can. And the reason this comes up and she's connected to Charlie is because of the decapitation and because Charlie did live in the area that she went missing from. Now, the other victim that he was linked to was a woman named Lisa Saunders, who at age 20 in 1988, 10 years after Carol Sullivan was killed, was found nude and lifeless on the side of the road in some bushes in an area named No Name Key. Vultures were actually what alerted authorities to the body. And according to the Miami Herald, she was missing her heart, brain, eyes, neck muscles, appendix, colon, vagina, left fallopian tube, ovaries, bladder, thyroid gland, and parts of her lung. Now, she had marks on her body indicating that her killer tied her to the back of a car as well and drug her about a half a mile before dumping her body. Mm. The pathologist couldn't say whether the organs were removed by a person or by the vultures. So, This might not fit the M.O. at all, or if maybe the cuts were crude and could be mistaken for vulture marks, maybe this is just the early signs of what was to come. Like, if this is truly connected, maybe his methods were just more crude and he wasn't as well practiced. But here's the thing. Like I said, those have never been conclusively linked to Charlie. He died in 2004. And in 2015, there are still articles about Lisa offering a Crime Stoppers reward. So this case is far from being considered closed. Not much else has been released about the 26 deaths that were investigated in connection to Charlie, or if any could be officially closed without him here to talk about them. In the book that I mentioned, there is a big section where they kind of line up Terry's daily journal entries with suspected victims. And it is really interesting. There are times where either she's out of town or she's like, you know, Charlie's acting really weird. He's been really funny these last couple of days that kind of line up well. But we know, you know, that's not proof of necessarily anything. I do think there were a lot of women who suffered at the hands of Charlie between the time he was 13 and when he died in his 40s. Women here in the U.S., maybe women in the Bahamas where he lived for a short time, But we will likely never know a true number and we'll likely never know why. Like, was Charlie Brandt just born evil or did something happen? I think very few people hold the real answer to that. One of those people is Rob Hemmert, who was the lead investigator on Michelle and Terry's case. In 2006, Charlie's mental health records were released to him. And he said that the records helped him understand why Charlie committed his crimes. And in the same book that I referenced earlier, it said that Charlie's mother nagged him. And growing up, his father, who grew up in Germany during Hitler's regime, was overly strict. But, like, could that really be what made him that way? The rest of us are just left to speculate. If you guys want to see pictures from this case, like the sketch or that really weird anatomy poster, you guys can go to our website, crimejunkiepodcast.com. And be sure to follow us on social at Crime Junkie Pod on Twitter and at Crime Junkie Podcast on Instagram. On the Instagram. We will be back <laughs> next week with a brand new episode. Crime Junkie is an audio Chuck production. So what do you think, Chuck? Do you approve? (coughs) Hi, Crime Junkies. I wanted to make sure you guys have heard the big news. Audio Chuck has a brand new show out right now called Park 
Predators. This show is hosted by our very own Delia D'Ambra, and this 11-part miniseries will take you to a new national park each week, and it will uncover the predators lurking within them. I know you crime junkies can never get enough good storytelling, so go subscribe right now to Park Predators, and we will see you in the park. Hi, crime junkies. I'm your host, Ashley Flowers. And I'm Britt. And you guys, I am so proud of all of us. We got a final tally. Oh, I haven't even heard this. I'm so excited. Yeah. Despite the fact that I clearly never took French in high school, and apparently I don't know how to pronounce Jacques, which a lot of you told me. You can stop emailing me. Thank you. I'm (laughs) awful and from the Midwest. Either way, we all band together, and we were able to raise, drum roll please, David, (laughs) $17,500 for the DNA Dope Project. Yes, I'm so excited. When I talked to the team over there, I mean, they were thrilled. They cannot thank you guys enough. I asked them to keep us updated on what cases they're able to solve. They said, you know, this is so good to have because there are so many cases that a lot of people have given up on and don't want to necessarily donate to. Um, So I think we're going to be able to solve a lot of cases that maybe have gotten forgotten. So you guys can follow those cases if you want to go to their website, DNA doproject.org. While we're letting the smart experts solve the cases, Britt and I are back to telling you another story, though. And this time, it's a story of a woman named Brandy Hall, who went missing at one of the most tumultuous times in her life. At first, people thought perhaps she'd left on her own. But as time passed and the secrets of her life were revealed, it became clear to her family and investigators that she had met with foul play. In August of 2006, Brandy Hall was 32 years old. She was a married mother of two, living in her home state of Florida, whose passion in life was helping people. She'd actually suffered a like horrible ATV accident in her childhood that left her in the hospital for months, like clinging to life. And she ended up making it out alive. But from that time on, she had this passion for helping other people. And when she was grown, she studied to be a firefighter, EMT, and paramedic. Wow. She met her husband, Jeff, while working as a firefighter. He was one, too, and he was just taken with her right away, saying that he'd never met anyone like her. She was tough and kind and caring. And in 1992, they married. Life was really good for them for a while. They had two kids. Jeff was promoted to chief of his station. Brandy got a full-time job at her station. And despite their crazy 24-hour shifts, they were still blessed with those two kids. And Brandy's mother would actually help take care of them. And like they both like got their schedules so they would work on the same days. They'd have to work like 24 hours and then they'd get two days off, but they made it work. Everything seemed peachy. But what have I said a thousand times? You never know what happens behind closed doors and you never really know anyone ever. 